We're going to be in Luke chapter 11. Um, so if you guys grab your Bibles, um, go to Luke 11. If you need Bibles, uh, we have ushers who have Bibles in their hands. So just raise your hand and they'll be more than happy to put one in your hand. And so today, or where Pastor Ted left off last week, um, I'm picking up this week and I get the fun section of teaching through religious hypocrisy and uh, bad religion. And so this is where we will be at this morning in Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 37. Um, but maybe religion, um, maybe it's hurt you. Maybe um, religion is, to you, it's been poison. Um, and there's an author, a New York best time, or best-selling author. He's also a journalist. His name is Ross Dutha. And in his book, Bad Religion, he has this quote. He says this, America's problem isn't too much religion or too little religion, but rather bad religion. And I don't know about you, but I've experienced this myself personally with people um, with bad religion. And it gives Jesus a bad name. And, it gives, um, and people like to paint the church with a broad brush because of a few people. Am I right? And so what we want to do as Christians in culture today is we got to fight against that. And we don't fight against that with necessarily our words, but how we serve Jesus through our actions and being called as Christians, as men and women to follow Jesus. Um, and as we follow well, and as we serve well, then those actions will, will be louder than our words. And so that's really the focus of the message this morning is uh, religion, Jesus, absolutely, um, it's I would say this, that Jesus is religion's biggest critic and also its only hope. And so if we want to um, represent Jesus well, we have to forget about religion and focus on relationship with him. And so in this, patch, in this passage of scripture, Jesus deals with the hypocrisy and the arrogance um, that, that comes with religion. And so if you would uh, pick up with me in verse 37, it says this, and now he uh, spoke, this is Jesus, to a certain Pharisee and asked him to dine with him. So he went in and sat down to eat. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not yet first washed before dinner. And then the Lord said to him, now you Pharisee, make the outward of the cup and the dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But rather give alms of such things as you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. So this is a very uh, famous passage here where Jesus deals with the Pharisee who is more concerned about the outward appearance than he is with the inward appearance. And so Jesus um, invites this guy, he goes to dinner with this guy and, he, and the guy, the Pharisees washing, does a ceremonial washing, you know, the law, um, they would heap up all these extra little loopholes and these little added things to the law. And so where Jesus was supposed to come in and just wash his hands and, and, and clean himself for dinner, um, this guy is doing all these crazy things. You ever seen, how many baseball fans out there? It's, it's October. So remember Nomar Garcia Parra and his batting gloves? Right? It was this ritual he would do. And it was like, I'm not even a baseball guy. I actually like sports. And so I don't follow baseball too much. Um, <laughs> But I was looking at John when I said that. Um, but anyways, it, it was... <laughs> All right, I'm sorry, John, forgive me. Um, made the Dodgers win. Um, so anyways, Jesus didn't wash the way that the Pharisee had thought he should have washed. And so he gets all up in arms. He's like, what, what's the deal here? And says, you washed up for dinner. Um, but really what, what Jesus cares about is what? The inward, right? And he uses this illustration of a cup. Have you guys ever pulled a dish out of your dishwasher and the outside's clean, but the inside there's still like mold and nasty stuff? How many of you moms out there get irritated when your kids wash like, like this? <laughs> Why are you bashfully raising your hand? I mean, you should be all limbs in the air. Like, amen. We didn't have a dishwasher growing up. And so I was the dishwasher, me and my brother. And uh, our washing, yeah, dishwasher. Um, we were the dishwashers. And so we would, we would... We were 12, 13 years old. We don't care. We're just like, yeah, put some soap on it. And, and it was still like soap water on the outside, hard water stains and all kinds of food on the inside. And my mom, this is a true story. My mom, she said, fine, I'm going to make you eat out of that now. And then she would make us eat out of it. She wouldn't let us wash it. So we learned our lesson pretty quick of what not to do. Um, so you should try that, moms, dads. It's, uh, it's brilliant. Um, so the Pharisee, the Pharisees did a great job of portraying um, the outside to be perfect and be clean. And in religion today, um, as Christians, we do this ourselves. I know I have done this. The reason I have authority to speak on religious hypocrisy is because I've been broken over my own. I don't, I don't 
preach to you from a position of already have arriving, but rather God's been doing business with me, especially this week as I'm preparing for this. But just in the last 10 years or 11 years of me walking with Jesus, um, I've been on my high horse plenty of times, and that's not the way God has called me to live or anyone else to live. And so what gives me the authority to be able to speak um, this morning is um, because I am in the same playing field with you. I'm broken over my own religious hypocrisy. And, um, and so this morning, God's given me this opportunity to level with you and be real with you. And so the Pharisees here, they had a problem. There was a big disconnect between them and the people. And what, what, what the difference was is they would put all these rules and regulations and they would try to make themselves so holy that they couldn't associate with the, the other people. And so we do this all the time in our own Christian lives. I know social media is a big thing. Um, when's the last time, I mean, they're out there, um, but when's the last time you've seen someone post just an awful picture of themselves? You know, you're like, oh, I wouldn't post that. Unless you're like older and you don't have a concept of like <laughs> what you should be posting, you know? Um, but most people today, I deal with high school students, so how many of you, are, I'm just kidding, I won't make you raise your hand. But we, we do the same thing with social media. Um, we're so concerned with how things appear on the outside when we're really hurting or dying or broken on the inside. And what we really need to be doing is letting the inside out so, so we can cry for help and look to Jesus and say, God, help me. I, I, I'm, I'm a mess. I'm an absolute mess. And the funny thing is, is when we get a real post on social media or Facebook, those posts end up blowing up, don't they? They get all the comments. Why? Why is that? Why do you think that's true? Because you identify with that. Am I right? So this is, why, this is what drew people to Jesus. Um, it's because they could identify with him. He was warm, he was welcoming. Not that he was broken, but he, it was his kindness that leads us to repentance, the Bible says. So I actually took this picture. So my, I got my wife's permission first, so you don't have to like, I can't believe this. But I got my wife's permission to post this picture. But I, I took it, um, I think it was 2011. This is my wife and my daughter sleeping on Mother's Day. <laughs> That's as real as motherhood gets. Am I right, moms? So you can take that off now. I mean, five seconds of airtime is all um, she allowed me to have. No, but, but I asked her, I said, hey, babe, can I, can I please post that picture? And that's one of the most beautiful pictures I've ever seen. Why? Because that's, that, that's real. That shows what a mom's job is never done. As my daughter on Mother's Day crawled into our bed at some point and crawled up underneath her face. And, um, and, and there you go. And so I think what the Pharisees, the, the, what they missed here and what we can miss today in our religious hypocrisy is that we try to distance ourselves from other people and try to make ourselves more holy than other people. And we have to convince people that we are better than them. And this is what the Pharisees tried to do. But in fact, they are not. The reason people flocked to Jesus wasn't because he was overtly religious. It wasn't because he did all the hand-washing ceremonies correctly. Um, but rather, he was a human being walking in authentic relationship with his father. And that's what drew people to Jesus. So it's, it's better for people to see the mess that we currently are in. It's better to, to, to let people in on that mess than for them to see the veneer that's over the mess. Because the mess is still there, am I right? Just because we post a certain picture or we stay a certain thing or we go and serve in a certain ministry doesn't change who we are on the inside. And so I think it's, it's important for us to allow people into our lives. And if we can't allow people into our lives, then we're gonna stay in that state of anxiety or we're gonna stay in that state of brokenness and, and, and we're gonna further disconnect ourselves from other people. Because here's the deal, when we look at social media and we look at things that are posted, we look at people as they're walking on the street, what we don't see is what's going on on the inside. What we see is the perfect veneer of someone on the outside, but we don't really know what's going on on the inside. And this is where the big disconnect between what we can do, what even pastors can do, um, and what leaders can do to the congregation as well. We have to let you in to let you know that we are human beings. We are called. I'm called. I know God has called me. I don't know, necessarily know why, but he, he's called me. Um, he uses the foolish things of the world to find, find the wild. Uh, the, what's that? What am I trying to say? The foolish things of the world. <laughs> that one. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> See? I just made my point even more clear. I wouldn't even do that on purpose. God, you are good. Um, but it's better for people to see the mess than for them to see the veneer over the mess. And that, that just helps us to be able to minister and level with people better. 
And so Jesus here in verses 42 through 52, he gives six warnings, six woes to the religious hypocrisy of the day. And he starts off here in, in, in verse 42, and he says this, he says, but woe to you Pharisee, for you tithe the mint and the rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. And so Jesus gets after him right away. He's having dinner with this Pharisee at his house. He says, look, you guys do so well to tithe. You even tithe from your garden. I mean, a little mint, the herbs, everything. You make sure that all that is done. But what you pass up is, is love, justice, and mercy. I like what Matthew's gospel says in Matthew 23, verse 23. It says this, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you pay tithe, the mint, and cumin, and, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, which is justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So love has to be the motivator of our service to God. It has to be the reason that we put uh, our tithe and offering in the bag. It has to be the reason that we go to that hospital and visit. It has to be the reason that we mow our next door, our next door neighbor's lawn. Love has to be the motivator. If you're trying to put some sort of veneer on a superficial lifestyle, then that soon the veneer will wipe away and people will see you for who you are. And what you will have done is lead people further away from the truth than to the truth. And so we have to stand up in our brokenness and in our mess because we're not perfect and admit who we are and say, you know what? The difference between me, I love what Josh said, the difference between someone who loves Jesus and who's, um, who is a Christian and unchristian is that my sins have been forgiven and, and I've accepted that free forgiveness. I've accepted that free gift of salvation. There's, there's, there's one prayer, there's one committed heart away from me and the person next to me. I haven't arrived, I haven't, uh, set myself up to be better than someone else because God's chosen me to serve him. But rather everything that I do and, and every, every hour that I get to spend um, here at this church, worshiping and serving you is, is a blessing. Um, and it doesn't make me any better than anybody else. It makes, uh, it makes me sit back and think about what's important in life. Is important making money? Yeah, you gotta make money, you gotta live right? You have to. But what's important in life? Because at the end of the day, statistics are overwhelming. 10 out of 10 people in this room are going to die. It's, it's crazy. So what are we going to do with the life that we've been given here? Are we going to live in religious hypocrisy and try to separate, separate ourselves from someone else to make ourselves look better? Or are we going to be all things, as Paul said, to all men and love people where they're at and by our brokenness and by our mess, be able to welcome them into the fold? And so the Pharisees had a real struggle with this. And so he says, woe to you guys in verse 42 that forsake justice and the love of God. They were so careful uh, to tithe from every little thing that they possibly have, but they did, it, they did it without motive. They did it without love. They did it without, um, they did it without love. In verse 43, Jesus goes on and gives another woe. He says, woe to those um, who love the spotlight, who love these greetings in the public square. Look at verse 43. It says, woe to you Pharisee, for you love the, the big seats in the synagogues and the greetings in the marketplace. So are you more concerned with being recognized for someone you wish you were or being recognized or, or striving to be that person that you wish you were? This is the, what the Pharisees fell into. They wanted to be perceived as someone that they weren't or someone that they weren't willing to die to self to be. They wanted to put on the persona and the facade that they were this person, but they weren't willing to sacrifice and weren't willing to do what it took to be that person, which is ultimately submit their lives to Jesus and his rule and his reign. And so I think this is something that we struggle with, that, that society that the world struggles with today, people are more concerned with, with being recognized for someone that they wish they would be, someone that they wish they were. So if you're, we're looking for attention, uh, we're looking for acceptance, we're looking for affirmation. That's what the world is after today. They, they desperately, desperately seek um, affirmation and acceptance. Um, I, I've served with you know, high school and junior high and, and now young adults for the last 10 years. And if I were to say there's one thing that they're after is, is ultimately it's acceptance. But they're looking for acceptance in all the wrong places. And so this is what exactly the, the Pharisees were struggling with. They wanted to be noticed. They wanted to be uh, elevated. They wanted to have this, this pristine, this, this uh, standing. And Jesus is like, look, it's not about that. What you guys are searching for out there, 
what, what, you, what you want, the affirmation from your peer, you're only going to be satisfied when you realize who you are in me. You'll only be satisfied when you realize who, your position in Christ, not your position in your workplace or not position in your community or in your household even. But who are you in Christ? And that's the question that I, I constantly struggle with and the constantly, I don't know if I struggle with it, but that's a, something that's constantly on my mind. Like, who am I in Christ? What has God called me to do? What has God called us to do as husbands, as fathers, as mothers, as wives, as children, as classmates? What has God called us to? Are we concerned with being recognized for somebody that we wish we were? Or are we striving to be that person? Because only when we're satisfied with the position in Christ can we be satisfied in the world. So what you're looking for in the world, Jesus is saying here, you're not going to find. The Pharisees will not find the status and the pristine that they're looking for amongst their peers, only when they submit their lives to Christ. And he goes on in verse 44, he says, woe to those who draw people away. Look at verse 44, it says, woe to you, you scribes and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you're like graves that are not seen, and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. So in... So here in, in Israel's history, what would happen is if you walked over a grave, you were ceremonial, uh, ceremonially unclean. And so Jesus is saying, look, you guys are like graves. You defile those people that you come in contact with by your bad religion and by your awful theology and doctrine. So I'm like, okay, as I study God's word and I look at this, what I'm constantly looking for is, God, what are you speaking to me in my heart? And what do you want to speak to the people that you were going to draw here by your spirit? So, I'll, well, I don't know about you, but as I look at this, I'm like, well, I wouldn't necessarily call you a grave. You know, I wouldn't necessarily call me a grave. I wouldn't necessarily call me uh, these things. But so what, what truth can we pull out of this for us in our lives? And um, what I came up with is, um, are we defiling God? Am I defiling God? Are you defiling God? by the way we represent him. If we call ourselves a Christian, are we representing him well? Are we leading people to, or are we leading people from and away from him? This is a tough pill to swallow because um, I like to joke, I like to have a good time, and, and I can do a lot of things in the name of, oh, I was just kidding, I was just joking around. Um, I, how many of you guys have been bitten by that before? Couple truthful people, awesome. Um, so that, that's me. And so I gotta constantly check my heart and say, okay, God, am I representing you well? So these, these scribes and, and these Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day, um, they did not represent Jesus well. In fact, they were leading people away from him. The reason why the, the early church struggled so much was because of the, the tension between religious, um, the Judaism versus this, what, the, the freedom that Christ offered after his death. Right? And so there was this constant battle. You look at that in the book of Galatians and Romans, it talks about it. I mean, literally the entire New Testament is this battle between uh, living uh, free lives in Christ, being justified freely by his grace, and those struggling with having to justify themselves by their works. And so what Jesus came to offer us um, was freedom. He came to liberate us. The law, the whole point of the law, it's like, um, I heard this in, I took a Romans class years ago at the Bible college and uh, I can't remember who the, the teacher was, but he said this and it always stuck with me. What the law is, um, it's like an x-ray. Now what happens if you break your arm? You have to go get an x-ray. What does the x-ray do? It re reveals that you got a broken arm. Can that x-ray, no matter how hard it tries, can the x-ray heal you? No, it just shows you you're jacked up, right? And you need someone to heal you, right? You need a cast. And so this is exactly what the law is pointing to do. Uh, Paul talks about it as a tutor. It was like a schoolmaster to point us to Jesus. And so these religious leaders, what they were trying to do is they were trying to heap up all these different laws and these rules and regulations that the, that the Christian church had to uh, adhere to, um, but that was gonna be what justified them rather than saying, yeah, you're broken people, you're a mess, I'm gonna point you to the Messiah, point you to Jesus, because that's what the law is supposed to do. It's like that x-ray, it reveals that we're broken, but we need, we need that healing, but the healing can't come from the x-ray. Healing only comes from, from Jesus. And so uh, Jesus says, woe to you, uh, you, you guys who, who draw people away by their religion. 
uh, by you, you're like a tomb. As you come by, you heap up all these laws, you heap up all these things on people that I, Jesus, had never intended for them, and you're calling that the way to justification. When rather, you're only gonna be justified through me and through the grace that I give. So shame on us if we ever mis- misrepresent Jesus. Shame on us if we cause people to fall away from Jesus by our sinful actions or by our arrogance or by our apathetic attitudes. I think more times than not, we struggle with, at least I do, more apathy than anything else, right? Just kind of like a, eh, attitude. Especially, I mean, I, I, I teach high school students regularly and, and how many of you have a high school student? Would you say that apathy is just running rampant in your home for the most part? Just like, I don't know, huh, 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 huh. Right, you ask them how was home, that's yeah, cool, huh, huh. <laughs> You can't get a word out of them. You can get a lot of shoulder shrugs and apathetic attitudes, or they've been growing up in the church. And so they, they know what words I'm saying, but those words have never penetrated the heart because they haven't been grown up and raised up in Jesus. They've been dropped off at a building and expected the church to disciple and to love and to minister and to lead their student to Jesus when really the church is supposed to come alongside and strengthen what the parent is already doing. And so if you are, if you are doing that, um, let, me, let me encourage you. We love your students. I love your students, but my job is not, is not to pastor them. My, my job is to come alongside them and, and guide and shape. You are their pastors. You're the one that lives with them 24 hours a day. You can't blame the church if your kids run amok, you can't blame the church. If your kids are disconnected, you can't blame anyone but yourself. You have to look inward, and we'll get to that later. We have to look inward. This is what Jesus is trying to do. Jesus is trying to get to the inward part of people's hearts to help them to realize that their hypocrisy in their religion is doing nothing but heaping up judgment on themselves. And Jesus wants to liberate us from that this morning. Jesus wants to liberate you guys as, as parents and as students from that this morning that we have to take responsibility for our own actions. We have to take responsibility for our own walks with Jesus. It's easy to point the finger at someone else. Oh, those religious hypocrites. You know, it's that cheesy thing where you got one pointing at someone else, you got three pointing back at you, but it's true. And so Jesus goes on and says, woe to you guys. Verse 44, you guys are like tombs. You guys are like graves and people walk over there defiling you. And this is hilarious in verse 45. It's probably my favorite verse out of the section because I, I, I'm, I, I like comedy. But in verse 45, it says this. Then one of the lawyers answered and said to him, teacher, <laughs> by saying these things, you reproach us also. He's like this one guy like, hey man, you hurt our feelings. <laughs> You're saying these hard things. This guy would have done better just to shut up, right? But since he spoke up, Jesus is like, okay, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you too. And it's just hilarious that this guy, Jesus wasn't probably going to even dress him, but since he spoke up, he's like, all right, I'll dress you too. In verse 40, 46, he says this. He says, woe to you also, you lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to those that expect people to live differently than themselves. Woe to you that expect others to live a life that they themselves are not willing to live. This is what Jesus is getting at the heart of the issue here. He says, look, you guys are heaping up all these extra burdens, all these extra laws, something that I never said, but what you want them to do is you want them to live this special life that you yourself can't even uphold, you yourself can't even do. Do we do this? Let me ask you guys a question. Think about about this. As Pastor Ted likes to say, I would say this, take a walk with this. Are you asking people, are you expecting more out of maybe your kids, your peers, your coworkers, your wife, your, your husband, your, your spouse, whatever it is, are you expecting out of them more than you're willing to give yourself? This is religious hypocrisy at its core right here. This is exactly what Jesus is challenging. He's challenging the idea that we ourselves can become moral gods at some point in our lives and that we can expect someone to live a certain way when we ourselves aren't even willing to live that way. Jesus, um, Jesus really attacks this head on. Um, and, and, and we put such high standards on people sometimes. We become the moral religious police um, and, and we expect them to do things that we, we don't do. 
I mean, how many of you guys have um, personal convictions? How many of you guys have a personal conviction about something? Okay. How many of you expect that same personal conviction for your neighbor to have that same personal conviction? If we're being honest, I would say about 50% of those hands probably still raise. Shame on you. Shame on me. That's unbiblical. Because God's burdened our heart with something doesn't mean he's burdened that person's heart. And that is hypocrisy for us to expect someone else to be convicted and, and the same way that you are. Now, there's law, there, there's, there's what the Bible teaches, which is very black and white. But then there's areas where there's liberties Paul talks about all the time. And there's some liberties that we have in Christ that others do not have. And just because someone else doesn't have that liberty doesn't make them more or less holier than you and vice versa. So Jesus is fighting against the idea that everyone um, or that these religious leaders were, were heaping up these burdens and these personal convictions on other people and they were shaming them publicly because they didn't share the same convictions that they themselves had. This is unbiblical. It doesn't teach this in scripture anywhere. I, I've read this Bible a couple of times and I have yet to find that in God's word. Now there's those things obviously that God says stay away from. And there's those areas that God's more silent on. And so why should we speak up when God's more silent? Religion preaches the demands of God, but it never preaches the provisions of God. And we don't want to be this person. See, Jesus um, absolutely hated this concept of all these burdens being heaped up on other people. And so what do you say in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, it's very, very popular. I have it up on the screen here. It says this, it says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. See, walking with Jesus isn't about a list of things we have to do a list of things that we can't do. Um, it's about a relationship. It's about freedom, freedom from guilt, freedom from sin, freedom from shame, freedom from condemnation. And in Christ, we have complete freedom from being condemned of our sin. But the key word is they're in Christ. Outside of Christ, we are going to be condemned for our sin. The Bible teaches that clearly. Romans 8, 1 says this, there, there is therefore now, that word is now, I capitalize it, underlined it here in my notes, because I want to emphasize that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. I emphasize now um, because, like I said, there is condemnation for those who are outside a relationship with Jesus Christ. Those who are living in perpetual religious hypocrisy. But Jesus says, look, if you just come to me, with your hypocrisy, you come to me. With the, the burdens, you come to me. If you're, if you're weary, if you're anxiety-ridden, if you're overwhelmed, if you come to me, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is easy. This is the whole idea. This is the gospel right here, that Jesus calls us to come to him. Not that we are, are too bad to come to him, but when we are in our worst, that's when Christ died for us when we were still enemies with God, Romans 5, 8 tells us, when we were still sinning, we were still enemies against God, that's when Christ died for us and he gave his life up for us while we're still in our sin. Not that we cleaned ourselves up, not that we came to him, not that we got rid of the hypocrisy in our lives, not that we get, got rid of the pharisaical attitudes that we contend to have, then come to Jesus, no, but rather when we were in our worst state, that's when Christ chose us. That's when Christ chose to die for us. All we have to do is admit we're, if, if you struggle with re religious hypocrisy like myself, you have to admit who you are and say, God, I need your help. There's not another service you can serve at. There's not another old lady you can walk across the street. There's not enough you can do to free yourself from the bondage that the law can heap up on you. The law is pointing you to Jesus for freedom. Will you run to that freedom? In verse 47 through 51, Jesus says, woe to you guys who pretend to honor me, but really that's not who you are. Read with me. It says, woe to you for you, build, uh, for you build the tombs of the prophets and your fathers killed them. 
In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, uh, they will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the, from the foundation of the world, uh, may be required of this generation from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, you uh, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. So Jesus here attacking the idea that these religious leaders had, well, like, look, my forefathers, my, my grandparents, grandparents, grandparents was this prophet or that person. You know, we are following the religious law. We are doing all the things that we need to do for us today. What does this look like? Maybe I go to church, I serve on Sundays, uh, I, I drop my kids off at Awanas, um, I drop my kids off at uh, junior high or high school ministry, or I've been to a parenting class one time, or whatever the case is, like I'm good. My grandparent, my, my, my papa w w was a pastor, doesn't that count for something? And so what, what are we upholding in public that we are destroying in the quietness of our heart? Just because we have this persona of like, well, I'm a Pharisee, or I'm a deacon here, or, or I serve in the children's, or I serve somewhere else. What matters is what's going on in the heart, the quietness of your heart. Jesus says we, does our traditionalism trump, and does it become a substitute for our relationship with Jesus? What are you upholding in the public eye that you're destroying in the quietness of your heart? It's like someone who gets behind and supports uh, the institution of marriage, and yet they are quietly destroying their own marriage by selfish living. You know, that's hypocrisy, guys. And I know that um, many of us in this room, you know, we would say, I am, I am for I am for marriage, but you're not willing to fight for your own. You're not willing to die to yourself. You're not willing to swallow your pride. And you would, you would preach the importance of marriage. You would, you would preach the importance of uh, traditional marriage, uh, and yet you're not upholding uh, your marriage in your own home. Or you would say, yeah, I, I, disciplining my kids, that's, that's a priority to me. I want to raise my kids up to know, love, and serve Jesus. I want to raise them... Uh, in the ways of the Lord, and yet you are anything but that at home. You know, this is the same concept here as these guys. They, 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 were, they would honor these dead prophets, and yet Jesus, the prophet, the, the son of God who came to take away the sin of the world is right before them. What did they do? They ran him out of town. They, they eventually, they crucified and they killed him. So those things that we say we're for, do our actions back that up? Or is it merely talk? And we all know that talk is what? Talk is cheap. You can call yourself whatever you want, but until you're about that, you're not that thing. You're not that person. And there's a, the joke that says, what you can go, uh, just because you go to a donut store doesn't make you a cop, right? You actually have to go through, Tim, I love you. Um, you actually have to go through the academy and serve. And um, just because you walk into a donut store doesn't mean you're a cop, you know? I love you, Tim. Um, <laughs> what are those... <laughs> Um, so verse 52, and he gets after him one last time here, the sixth and final warning. And he says this, he says, woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the king, the, the key of knowledge. You do not enter in yourselves and those who are entering in you hindered. So Jesus would sum it up this way. Woe to those who falsely teach the word of God. So that they remove the key. Who is the key to knowledge? Who is the key to truth? Jesus. John chapter four, verse six says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. They led people away from Jesus, not to Jesus. They withheld, they had the special knowledge that only they, the priests, or only they, the, the uh, Pharisees, would hold on to. And, and that's just unbiblical. Here's the, idea, here's the whole thing about this Bible. This is what God has given us so that we would know him. We would know the heart and the mind of God. The book of Revelation, you, you know what revelation means? 
reveal, right? This is God's heart. He wants to reveal himself to us. The reason that we may not know God is because we have not sought him. God says, seek me and you will find me. Knock, the door will be answered. He is not interested in having some sort of secret society, but rather what his heart and his mind is for us is that we would get to know him. Jesus is like just begging us to be interested in having a relationship with him. Jesus so desperately wants, he is so madly in love with me, it's unbelievable. I can't even believe that. That he would love someone like me, that he would love someone like you. It's a true miracle. And what we do when we neglect that relationship is we're, we're, we're just, we're setting ourselves up for failure. You want to know Jesus, you want to get to know him, um, it's easy, you seek him which takes diligence. I talk to people all the time, like, well, where do I start? You gotta start somewhere. Open up the gospels and just start reading. Ask God to reveal himself to you. I promise you he will. I promise you he will. So Jesus says, woe to you who falsely teach, um, you know, because their, their legalistic approach to the scripture had taken away understanding of who Jesus was. And Jesus was sitting there right in front of him. And yet they were withholding people from going to him by their bad religion and by their hypocrisy. The shame on us if we uh, project uh, our, our own personal convictions onto uh, other people and, uh, and we have a re- legalistic approach to God's word and we have a legalistic approach to how people ought to live their lives. You know, here's a concept that we should consider. You worry about what Jesus has called you to. Let, let us worry about what Jesus has called us to. It's so easy to be looking at other people and noticing all the things that maybe you sh- they should do differently. But what about yourself? First, we need to look inward and ask God to cleanse us from the inside out. Shame on us for trying to compare or compensate our lack of intimacy with God with, um, with this veneer and this, this idea of having this bad religion that's never gonna lead people to Jesus. We can't compensate a relationship with God with more legalistic um, parameters in which we should live by. It's not gonna lead us. It's definitely not gonna lead other people to Jesus. So let me ask you guys a couple of questions and then we'll close. Um, Some hard questions this morning. The same questions I've asked myself this week preparing. Um, Who are you? Who are you when nobody is looking? Who are you when uh, you're at work? Who are you when you're at school? Who are you when your spouse isn't around? Um, who are you? And I think if we look at that question and we take a, a serious consideration of that, um, I think we'll, we'll realize that we need Jesus more than we thought we did. The closer I get to the Lord, the more I realize how much I absolutely depend and need him. Jesus said, I can do nothing apart from the Father. If that, Jesus said that, how much more is that true for Kyle? How much more is that true for you? If Jesus said that, that's true for us. And I think that as Jesus starts with the first illustration of the cup needing to be clean, cleansed from the inside, then the outside, uh, I, I wanna kind of close with that concept here. And, and King David knew that. He fell in 2 Samuel chapter 11 with taking Bathsheba as his wife and then having Uriah murdered. And his response to his sin um, was key. His response to his sin was key. In Psalm 51, David realized that he needed to be cleansed from the inside out. That not enough patching um, of his sin was gonna do, but he needed to be cleansed. Psalm 51, six through 12 says this, behold, this is David's, cry to the Lord, plead for forgiveness after he had fallen. It says, behold, um, you desire truth in my inward parts and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. See, acknowledge that God wants to do, um, I think 
forgiveness and getting outside of religious hypocrisy and walking in truth and authentic relationship with Jesus begins with um, acknowledging that we need to be cleansed from the inside out, acknowledging our sin, acknowledging my hypocrisy, your hypocrisy, acknowledging our lack of relationship and allow God to start working from the inside out versus the outside in. God isn't interested in in the walking dead, but rather making dead people uh, walk alive. And that's what he wants to do in my life. That's what he's done in my life. That's what he's continuing to do in my life as he's cleansing me day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Um, And I would say that um, some of you here in this room are, are dead on the inside. They're walking outside of authentic relationship with Jesus. And some of you need to be cleansed of that. You love Jesus, but you are dead on the inside right now. And others of you are completely outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And here's the good news for both of those people. All it takes is you to to recognize that and ask God to cleanse you and he will. God says that he will forgive you. He'll put our sins as far as the east is from the west. That's the beautiful thing about the gospel is that God loves us. And that while we're still sinners against us, or while we're still sinning against him, that's when Jesus came. That's when he died. That's when he chose us. So as I sum it up, I would say this, that religion is blindness. It's blindness to God's grace. It's blindness to our own sin. It's blindness to the, to the, the provision that God has made for our sin. Um, and religion makes us think that we are serving God when really we're serving ourselves. It's law without love. It's conviction without compassion, guilt without grace, and preaching um, without practice. And how we respond to religious hypocrisy uh, will be the difference between us walking in liberty and walking in condemnation. In verse 53 and 54, the religious leaders were, were faced with, what am I gonna do with these six warnings that Jesus gave? And this is what they said. And he said to these, these things to them and the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him and vehemently um, and to cross-examine him about many things, laying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. So as you can see here, they, they chose to refuse these warnings and be condemned and be outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ. So we can either take offense to the things that God has spoken to us this morning and say, well, I'm not that way or I'm not that, that way. Or we can take heed to them And we can ask God, like David, to cleanse us from the inside out. Because I think if we're all honest with ourselves, every single one of us in this room, myself included, every single one of us has struggled with some aspect of these six warnings at some point in our lives. And if we want to be uh, conduits of God's love and his grace and his mercy to the community around us, then we need to start with the cleansing from the inside, allowing God to do the cleansing from the inside out. And by the way that we live our lives in authentic relationship and community with God, that will draw people unto Jesus. Amen.